Ben Pavlo is an author and host of the podcast Self Help for At Risk Teens and he's got a new book out with the same name and he's here with us now. How are you today? I'm doing great, Toby. Thank you for having me. Now, your new book is called Self Help for At Risk Teens. Is this something that's inspired by your own upbringing? Yes, absolutely. That's exactly why I wrote the book. And can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, here in the United States. And basically, I didn't really know my father. He left when I was three, and he suddenly passed away when I was 10. And I had no relationship with him. So I was pretty much raised by a single mother. And you know, so I was pretty much at risk for my bad behavior from the beginning. And then when my, when I was 16, my mom passed away. And even before that, I was already trending towards getting a lot of trouble. So once she passed away and I was pretty much forced to raise myself, I, there was a lot I didn't know. Yeah. And basically the reason why I wrote the book is to help young kids who may be at risk now to help them avoid becoming a juvenile delinquent like I did. Yeah. And you've got the podcast as well that you do. Is the podcast similar to the book you've got? Yes, absolutely. It's very similar in the way that I've done it up to this point. Now, the, the, the book was just released about a month ago. The podcast is about two months old. So the podcast, the way I started out was I did the introduction for the first episode. I read the introduction to the book and go over the table of contents. And then for the first 19 episodes, I do a basically an overview of each chapter of the book. So each episode is a chapter and I cover the topics. I go into a little bit about every subject that I cover in the book in them first 19 episodes. Uh, apart from a couple other random ones that are mixed in, basically it's all the chapters, and it's basically all all self help, personal development is, but in this, and also in the beginning of the book it talks about helping people identify what is that what what they're at risk of, why they would be considered at risk. It helps them understand, um, it understands like uh, overcoming grief and loss and understanding that how anger affects them, uh, helps them adapt to their living situations because a lot of kids are being raised by either a single parent or a grandmother, or they may even be in a system like I was for a while. So I, I touch on a lot of that throughout the book and the podcast basically does that as well as it's going to grow and expand from that into all of the self-help and personal development topics that I feel can help a young person basically take their lives from where they are now to where they want to go. What gave you that idea to release a podcast along with the book? Well, actually, that wasn't part of my original plan. I mean, my book was something I had been thinking about for quite a long time, a few years. And I finally got buckled down and just said, I'm going to go for it and do it. And while I was doing my research about ways to write the book and also how to self-publish the book, because I really am not, I was never a writer and I didn't know anything about how to, how to really write it professionally and to also, you know, how to self-publish it. So in my course of researching it, I discovered a lot of writers have podcasts and they use, you know, different ways to get their message out. So after I got the book done on my end, as far as like the writing part, and I sent it to an editor, then I started to focus on how else am I going to get my message out? And I started to research what it would take to start a podcast. And then I started comparing companies and I honed in on one and, and I just basically, I joined some Facebook groups to learn a little bit, but then I just went for it. And for the book, does it focus on particular parts of your life, maybe some real examples, or is it very much a sort of facts rather than experience book? No, absolutely. It's all, it's, my story is throughout the whole entire book. It's, it's basically all my experiences, good and bad, throughout the whole book. It talks about how 
like I said, I was raised by a single mother. It gives real examples. It talks about how I was expelled from middle uh, grade school in the fifth grade for bad behavior. I was expelled. And then I, I talk about how I was uh, sentenced to juvenile detention for a year. And I talk about how I use drugs and alcohol and how I overcame that stuff. I talk about how I was a criminal. I was a juvenile delinquent. I was a thief when I was a teenager. And all the money I made as a teenager mostly was through illegal ways. And I talk about that and I talk about why it's wrong and how you can make money the legal way. I have a whole chapter on making money. Yeah. And then I also transition into my later stages in life where I learned how to make money on the internet and got involved in home-based business, which is what led me to personal development and self-help. And then, you know, to where I am today. So it's, it's like a whole, it's my, it's not my life story, but I like it throughout the whole thing. I do give real life examples. Do you think that self-help books are important to people? Because some people, some celebrities have said that they've really changed them and other people don't really believe in them. Do you think that they're an essential thing for everybody to sort of try? Absolutely. I think, I think that the thing that differentiates the people who say it worked and the ones who say it didn't is the is some people read it and take action and follow what they learn and some people just read it and put it down and then they don't follow up yeah and this book how long did it take you to write it so i had the ideas i i was keeping a running list of ideas for about the past year and i didn't actually i started to record um using a re- digital recorder to um, record the first drafts starting in the beginning of June when I really got serious. So I created an outline based on my topics. Each chapter has like five to 10 topics within the chapter that are all relevant together. So from the, from the there was many months of ideas, but once I really buckled down and started I started recording my first drafts with a headset and a digital recorder. And because of COVID, you know, we're stuck in the house. So that was when I really said, okay, I have all this time on my hands. I, I got to get away from the COVID stuff because it's, it's de- depressing. And so I started to take daily walks down the road to the park and stuff. And I would record one chapter every day. So I had an outline with me on paper, a rough outline, just with like bullet points. And then I would talk into my recorder and I would come, I would transcribe it into my Word document. And that was my first draft. And it took me about not even, you know, a few weeks to record the first draft. Then I started to do a little self-editing and then a few passes through that. And that's when I hired an editor. So from the time I recorded the first draft of the first chapter was like the very very first week of June until the time it was I self-published it was the end of September. So four months from the time I put the first word on paper to the time the book was available for purchase. Is it easy or exhausting for you to transfer what you've recorded into words and text? Well, not really because I learned how to do it and I watch a lot of YouTube videos. I read a lot of books and everything I've learned how to do about writing and publishing and everything in between, I actually made a list and put all that, all them resources on my website. I actually have a, a video on my company website, self, the, the self-help company under the writing tools page where I show a video of me recording it, walking through the park. Yeah. Then I come home and I transcribe it and I show that part. And then I show the word document and how it's a finished product. So I actually do a full video walkthrough of how I do the process. Is this your full-time career writing books? So I have another income. So this, I don't rely on this as an income. Yeah. It's not a full-time job. I've made no money from doing this book. I've made no money from doing this podcast. It's cost me thousands of dollars to start my own business and to write and publish the book because I hired an editor, I hired a cover designer, I hired a book formatter, and I've hired some other freelancers to do some other things. And it's all been money out of pocket. Everything I've done has been put money out. I've made no money. 
Now I have sold some books so far since it's been available, but you don't get paid right away. Mm. So I won't get paid for the things that sell this month for like 60 days or more. Oh. And have you read any self-help books that have helped you yourself? Absolutely. I've been reading them for 14 years and I've read hundreds. I have hundreds here and I'm also a big user of the library books and I listen to a lot of audio books and I have books and have read books on just about every topic that there is in the self-help world. And that's why I believe so strongly in it because I was literally a street kid that was using drugs, selling drugs, stealing, robbing, everything just to survive. And when I, even after I was a teenager into my early twenties, I had a lot of issues like this. And even when I had jobs, it was working paycheck to paycheck and I still was ne never getting anywhere. And so it wasn't until I was introduced to self-help and personal development resources when I was 28 years old that I really changed my life. And I have changed my life 180 degrees and I owe it all to the self-help and just the personal growth I've been able to achieve through applying what I've been learning. Yes. And for the podcast, do you listen to any other podcasts that you've sort of taken a few ideas from? So I listen to a lot of podcasts uh, on writing, especially when I first started and wanted to learn how to become a writer and also become a self-published author. Yeah. So I listen to a lot of podcasts about that stuff. And I do listen to other uh, podcasts related to the self-help type of things that I like to learn. Uh, I don't really listen to many just entertaining podcasts. I Mostly everything I listen to is, is educational in some way. Okay. How have your friends and family reacted to you writing these books? Have they been supportive? Yeah, absolutely. My, my, my wife and my stepdaughter are who I live with. And they're my biggest, biggest fans. And they supported me the whole way. They have been encouraging me from day one, even when the idea was just simply an idea. They were like, you have to do this. You have to do this. And even for the many months that I was like in and out and doing a little and then not doing a little, they kept saying, you got to get back to doing your writing. You have to get back to doing your writing. Mm -hmm. So they were definitely some of my biggest cheerleaders. And aside from that, being as though it's like COVID and we haven't really been in touch with like physically seeing many people, uh, everyone I've spoken to and all that, they all, I, you know, I bought a whole bunch of copies. I ordered them because it's print on demand. So I don't stock any books. It, everything, if you buy it from Amazon, they print it and they ship it. Like I don't see the books. Yeah. So I ordered a bunch and then I sent them to friends and family and those who have read it really love it. They all think it's awesome and they're very proud from it. And are they also who kind of keep you going if you've had days where you just didn't feel like writing or struggle to come up with content? Well, that's, the thing is, they basically encourage me to chill and take breaks because oh. I pretty much have been at this from the time I wake up to the time I go to bed for months on end. So there is no lack of motivation because I'm really enjoying what I do. So it's basically more of them saying, you need to take a break. Yeah. Did the book finish how you thought it would start out or did it become a kind of completely different thing along the way as you worked on it? It did come out like I expected because I did plan it. I did envision it. I use a lot of the techniques I talk about with you know, vision boards and, and visualization and, you know, seeing it in my mind first and knowing what I wanted it to come out like. Now, there were some, some things out of my control where it comes to, you know, having the cover done by someone else and the formatting was done by someone else. So, you know, I had the book formatted in a Word document one way. And when I gave it to the formatter, they kind of changed some things that, I wasn't expecting. So there were some things that were out of my control. But as far as the content goes and what's written in the book, it was all me other than the editor, you know, saying, hey, you need to fix this or fix that. But the general concept is is my vision. And it, and it, and it came out exactly the way I wanted it mm. as far as I didn't really want it to be about me. I want it to be like for the reader. 
but I wanted to give real life experience because in doing my research, I realized that a lot of the books that are out there, especially for teenagers, they're written by like doctors or counselors or psychiatrists or psychologists or people who have just gone to school to learn it, yeah. but have never lived. And so I feel like I bring a new perspective and a fresh voice and something people can relate to because I have been there. I have done that and I have overcome the same obstacles that they're going through. Yeah, I think there's nothing more important when having a self-help book than to have somebody who's actually gone through that, right? Yeah, that's that's what I believe. And I really feel like is if people can just know about the book and read it, it will help them. Definitely. And are there any other challenges you had in your own kind of personal experience writing the book that you kind of hit a brick wall maybe at certain parts and didn't know what to do next? Yeah, the whole way. I mean, the whole entire experience was new to me. So I had to learn every single step, one step at a time. And I joined a lot of Facebook groups. I joined a lot of other, I actually was a member of a, a, a writer's group in the local library until the COVID thing happened before they shut the libraries down. But I knew nothing yeah. about how to do this. So every step of the way, I had to learn it. So there was a lot that, well, some came easy and some were pretty difficult and stressful and like, you know, banging my head against the wall wondering, John, the way they said to do it seems so easy, but now I'm trying to do this and it's, it's harder than it looks. So there was a lot of uh, wasted money. I spent money on certain, uh, let's call it tools, like um, writing tools that I found that are real popular within the writing community for independent authors, but they, they were like over technical, they were too technical. And I found myself like getting stressed out and frustrated trying to learn the software yeah. when all I really wanted to do was write the book. Yeah, exactly. And it's called self-help for at-risk teens, of course. What would you describe as an at-risk teen? Is it somebody who's had a similar experience to you? Or could it be anyone who's at risk in any way? Well, it's, it's more, in my mind, it's more people who have grown up through similar situations as me in the sense that, you know, and I, I lay this out in the first chapter as far as why you're at risk. It's someone who maybe has been raised by a single parent or has lost both parents possibly, or their parent is alive and well, but just not in their lives. And so they have no role models. And it doesn't matter whether it's a, fa a mother or a father. If you only have one parent in your life, there's a lot that both parents bring to the table that if you don't have that equal balance or that discipline, you know, you're at risk for certain behaviors. And if you're already exposed to drugs and alcohol at a young age, because of maybe you do have two parents living with you, but they like to drink and do drugs and they use, use a lot of foul language. And if that's what you're around and that's what you're exposed to, that's the way you're going to kind of think is normal. And if you think using drugs and alcohol is normal as a 13, 14 year old, you're going to be in for a life of trouble. And yeah. this book is not for every teenager. And the reason why I say at risk is because I want to make sure it's for the real at risk teens. Look, Every teen and ager is at risk. Everyone who has a TikTok account is at risk of something. Yeah. You're at risk of, you know, having low self-esteem because you have people making negative comments. You know, there's a lot of reasons why teenagers are at risk, but this is more for kids, like I said, that they don't have the structure. They don't have the discipline. They don't have the family. They don't have... The, you know they're they're just really like have a lot of odds stacked against them yeah have you ever kind of volunteered or worked with people who would be considered at risk teens on the side of writing this book no because i'm not this is not my job it has never been i've never been a counselor or anything like that although in the process of writing the book and alongside of it i did become a certified life coach so I took oh. a course, it was like 30 something hours and I did become a certified life coach. But the thing about it is I know a lot of at-risk teens. I know my, my friend's kids or my, let's just say, I don't want to like go into specifics about who, 
but yeah. I know kids that are in these situations and I do talk to them when I can and I give advice where I can, but I'm not a, I'm not a doctor. And that's what separates me is I don't give like, like say per se advice. I don't tell, I'm not trying to help you change the past. I'm not trying to help kids change the past or heal old wounds. My job as a certified life coach is to just give them techniques, tips, and strategies on how to take their lives from where they are now to where they want to go. Definitely. And when you were growing up, did you think that what you were doing was the right path or did you kind of know that maybe it wasn't the best options for you? Well, I don't, I don't think that I thought it was right. Mm. I just think it was all I knew. Yeah. And I didn't have a lot of role models and I didn't have a lot of people who were positive in my life. I didn't have anybody asking me, you know, what did you want to be when you grow up? Do you want to go to college or any of that? Nobody ever did that for me. Nobody ever said that. So I, most of the people I looked up to as a young teenager were the people who were making money on the street, drug dealers and things like that. And, you know, I didn't have a lot of role models and I didn't have a lot of people trying to lift me up. So although I was getting arrested, like I said, I was expelled from my first school at 10 years old. I was arrested for the first time probably when I was 13 years old and it, it never stopped. So yeah. in retrospect, I know it wasn't good. I just didn't know any better. It was what was normal because growing up in Philadelphia, it's, this is what everyone was dealing with. Do you think that that's changed since then or is it still very much of a big problem there? I think it's a really big problem. And that's why I moved out of the city six years ago and I have no intentions of going back. Actually, just as of yesterday, there was a cop that shot a kid uh, who had a knife or whatever. And now they're like rioting in the streets and destroying property. And the, the city yeah. is insane. And I want no parts of it. So I've moved. I've lived in three different states since moving out of Philadelphia. I've been able to live at the Jersey Shore at the beach. I lived in Florida for three and a half years. And I recently, within the last, uh, I guess, eight months now, I live in central North Carolina in a nice, quiet suburb. And, you know, I've, I've basically created a life where I'm living what I want to live, where I want to live, doing what I want to do, and avoiding all negativity and all people who are negative. Yeah. And when you went to publish this book, were publishers very open to the idea or did you struggle to find someone who wanted to get behind it? So the thing is, I never attempted to publish it with any publisher. I learned from the very beginning about how to self-publish it, becoming an independent publisher. And originally, all I knew of was Amazon. But then through reading books and stuff, I created my own company. The self-help company is the publishing company of this book. Okay. Yeah. So I independently published it through all kinds of major networks. Like I'd publish it directly with Amazon, directly with Barnes and Noble, directly with Apple books, directly with Google. So my company is the publisher of this book and nobody could say no to me. Yeah, that's very that's true indeed. Yeah. You could write any book you want. And if you're a publisher and it fits the format and it the files are correct, you could publish anything you want if you know how to do it. How easy is it to start your publishing company? It's a lot of money or is it quite easy? Well, to start the company itself, where I live in North Carolina, I think it cost me $125 to register an LLC. And then it cost me... Uh, you know, maybe like 50 more dollars to register that that company with the state. And then I had to apply for a uh, tax ID number with the government. And altogether to start the company, it probably only cost me like 500 bucks. Yeah, it's not as much as you'd think it would be. No, it's not. And, you know, there's services out there like LegalZoom and, and all that will charge you through the nose to do it for you. But because mm -hmm. I had time, I had more time than I had money. So I just did it myself and just learned what I need to do and then just did it step by step. So was the actual printing of the book more than um, starting the company then? Well, the printing of the book itself doesn't actually cost money either. It was the people I hired along the way. It was the editor. 
It was the book cover designer. It was the formatting company. I had to purchase the ISBN numbers and the barcodes and things like that. So I would say the book probably cost me a little more than a thousand dollars. I probably have about cost me about fifteen hundred dollars, maybe roughly, mm. and including like the tools and the softwares that I used and bought to do it with. So that's why I say I got maybe two thousand dollars I've spent in the last eight months to get this all up and running. Okay. And in the future, the not too distant future, hopefully, have you got any more books coming out soon? Actually, that's a great question because I am already starting to create my outline for the next book. So next book is going to be like one step up from this one, where this book is for kids who are just kind of showing signs of having some issues, but aren't really in full trouble yet. So this is to keep kids who are just at risk from becoming juvenile delinquents and real in getting into real trouble. The next book is going to be for that next level. It's going to be for the kids who are juvenile delinquents, who have already been in trouble, who are currently in trouble, and to help them avoid becoming an adult career criminal. Yeah. In the meantime, for this book, where are we able to find it online and purchase it and everything? So the book, Self-Help for At-Risk Teens, is available on most all major booksellers. It's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Apple Books, Google Books, Kobo, if you're in Canada, it's popular. Uh, But basically, I've made it available pretty much everywhere I can. And on my website, theselfhelpcompany.com, I have a page for the book, and I list most of the places it's available there and I add them as it becomes available in new places. And the podcast as well, where is that? Again, I've made it available as many places as possible. As of right now, it's in every major podcast directory that exists except for Pandora, which takes forever to approve. But so find it in iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcast, Apple Music, which if you're an Amazon Prime member and you have Amazon Music included, Amazon just launched podcasting in Amazon Music. So that's, you know, it's in every big one, Stitcher, Spotify, everywhere. And again, on my website at the self-help company, I have a page for the podcast, which lists all the directory links. So depending on which uh, podcast app you use, you'll be able to know if it's available there. And I always update that website. So as I submit it to a new directory, if I find one that I'm not in yet and I get approved, I add that link to the page. Great. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show today. And hopefully we'll be able to speak to you soon. Yeah, absolutely. It's been a pleasure, Toby. I really appreciate you taking the time.